All right, we are all set and start rolling. So welcome back. Um, let's begin today's lecture. Again, uh, we're going to begin our journey to talk about scaring techniques for soft matter, OK? And uh, I have uploaded everything in the canvas, so you should be able to see it. And some extra reading or watching, I call it, on the on the canvas, so you have to take a look at those assignments and uh, try to finish them on time, okay? So, before I start, I'm wondering, have everybody got all the information you need to get the book? I think there was one or two of you have not received it, make sure you get it. And uh, for the first part, we're gonna talk about x-ray scattering. It's gonna be introduction of the x-ray and when I think about the teaching the class, the first thing I want to make sure everybody understands is why we need to learn this lecture at the first place. Okay? So, here is a few bullet points, outlines, what we're going to chat about today and the next lecture. Okay? It's too big to cover in one, but we're going to talk about all these. Why you should care about x-ray scattering technique for polymer science? And we're going to discuss about that in a few moments. Why there is some historical role um, x-ray technique actually played for material science? It played a huge role. It made a lot of great contributions. We're going to briefly review that. Um, we're going to also talk a little bit about how does the x-ray interact with matters, but that's likely going to be the next lecture. We're going to talk about the first few, okay? Then we're going to finish with um, other techniques. Although we call it basic scattering techniques, but we're not going to only cover x-ray, but we will cover neutrons and light scattering. They are very similar in many sense. They are fundamentally the same except uh, what probe we choose to interact with our matter differs slightly. In some cases, it's x-ray photons. In other cases, it's going to be um, electrons or lasers, photons, etc., etc. OK, so let's begin to ask uh, the most important question of this lecture. Why everybody in this room? why we want to do this at the first place. The question cannot be, I need three credit to graduate. <laughs> I need an alternate answer. Let's start with Michael. What do you think x-ray can help you? Uh, actually, probably the electronic structure of material, because the electronic structure dictates properties, and properties that everything that the material scientist cares about. Very good answer. <laughs> Lena, you ready? I was curious why you started it. To think about uh, signing up for this class. Uh -huh. Well, I was thinking about um, how we load ordered materials such as like graphene platelets and whatnot into mm -hmm. amorphous glossy networks. So, looking at how X rays interact with different states of order. Okay. Okay. So dispersion. In short sense, Michael is going to be the next generation of electronic. <laughs> you want to make the next generation composite material. <laughs> And you want to have better ways to understand that. Nathan? It applies to my current research uh, in a, looking at the phase separation for different materials. OK. It's also, I heard about looking at the different phase, so morphology again. How about uh, Ben? Well, I was thinking about graduating in spring, and I needed three credits. Perfect. <laughs> uh, I think there are at least two, three of you uh, Thinking along this line. That's the very reason, Ben. Because <laughs> I am the only one on market for giving you to three credits, right? <laughs> so I got the privilege to be a monopoly in, in this particular. So congrats. It's a big milestone to graduate next spring. Kyle? Uh, I can see inside my materials. OK, OK, so, cool. So we're going to do two more, then we're going to stop with mine. Uh, Makila. Uh, because I didn't know anything about x-ray scattering. 
Mm -hmm. And your advisor thinks it's a cool technique. You say, hey, Makita, why don't you just sign up? <laughs> Perfect. Now I have three ways to understand. I want to graduate. I want my advisor thinks it's cool. And then there's the other reasons I want to characterize my material better. Perfect. But, 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 oh, I forgot Mark. Mark, you're the last one. Probably the best answer. Wonderful. Understanding block of polymer assembly, right? So in many things that we heard about, is this what I'm going to talk about just a second, is why we need to use this technique. You need to understand this particular question before you actually begin this class. So I want to ask everybody to take not too long, 30 seconds to think exactly reason. Can't be. I need credit. Why? and when I possibly could benefit from, from this technique, okay? This will help you to understand better what we want to do in the next three months. It will give you a reason and a motivation to keep moving forward. All right, a, a little bit of silent moment, then I'm going to talk about particularly this slide. All right, gonna get a countdown. 10, 8, 5, 2, 3, 1. All right, that's how my son counts. You know? <laughs> Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna learn about this. I really admire a person, an inspiring talker called Simon Sinek. Um, I will probably watch too much YouTube video, but he's the one I particularly like. He is the one is took the occupation to talk about success to really successful companies, and he liked to educate them about the gold circle. I posted a link in the canvas in case some of you are interested, not too long, 20 minutes. He talks about why Apple is more successful than the other company, for example. Why you should not sell, say, we make the best phone. Instead, of you should understand why you make the best phone. You should sell as we sell the best user experience. Okay? Same here. I don't want everybody to learn. I can operate an x-ray at the best. I, can, I know how to operate the instrument. I think at the end of the class, every single of you will be able to. But start with inner circle. Why? Understand what you want to do with x-ray that will help you go a longer way. And understand how you're going to do x-ray. That's also pretty easy because we're going to go through all of this. And last, what is x-ray scattering? Is I think the least important because even if you don't know what is x-ray scattering, at the end of the day, you just need to know what x-ray why you need the, the tool and how it can help you understand a set of problems. All right? Like Michael says, it can help me developing a better electronic material. That's enough for you. I think that's enough for many program, uh, project manager. At the end of the day, you want to know why you need X-ray at the first place so you can assign a better um, game plan for your company, for your project, etc. We're going to cover all of these, but I want to really emphasize why. Think about this. This is the number one important question. I see students come and go in graduate school. Some of the reason that they sign up for graduate school, my classmate did this. I probably should go to graduate school too without knowing what graduate school is and why you actually want to go for graduate school. Right? A lot of them, you know, time. With the time goes by, with the time, I start to think it's really the reason I want to go to graduate school because I want to do something other people do. Because he, didn't, or he or she didn't understand why he want to do graduate school at the first place. So make sure you understand why you need to sign up x-ray scattering before we talk next three months. All right, so now here is my reason 
Why? You should know a little bit about x-ray. Look at this, I think it's yeah, pretty self-explanatory. Our human being comes from a long time, Stone Age, collecting stones, make axes, shaping them to make arrowheads to Bronze Age, Iron Age, nowadays Composite Age. And this is one of the future age that many people think resides in the nanomaterial, or more recently, it will be quantum material. As you can see, our society drives quite a lot by what material is available. So there is a constant need and interest to developing, to develop better, more advanced, more sophisticated material for the application to addressing our society need, be it energy, health, environmental, uh, aerospace, of course, a big part of it, right? So, but with the advance of those material comes with importance of understanding it because material do give you a lot of advantage. Let, let me show you an example of armor. Bronze Age, oh, light, nice, gold, and shiny, but they're not the strongest material. You can forge these, um, made in probably hundreds of BC, before century, two, three thousand years ago. This is a mid-century armory. If you go to uh, museum, uh, what is that called? The, the nicest museum in New York City. Yeah, probably, but not the modern art. The other one, New York, Muni. Mm -hmm. There's two, I forgot the exact name. There is an armory display for mid-century, and you can see all these beautiful armories, made of iron, by the way. They are much, much tougher and stronger than all these bronze. Give them a lot of advantages in the battlefield, that's why if you come from another age, you're not like conquering the previous generation of civilization. You're slaughtering them, basically. If you're, any, you're anywhere curious about that, there's actually interesting YouTubers make Bronze Age weapons versus Iron Age. I didn't watch them, disclaimer. I just, for the class, <laughs> I want to make my point. And nowadays, full body armor made of Kevlar. You know, they would never think about this would be strong and tough. But it, it is, has ability to stop a bullet running at hundreds of meters per second. So, it is quite important to understand and developing better materials at any point of the time. And this is not a simple task, developing any material. You need a group of talented experts with complementary knowledges, chemistry, physics, engineering, probably I would add art and design. You need design people on team to make your product pretty. It's interesting that when I was at Sanford University, we wrote proposal not all between scientists, we have people from arts and design school to come into play so that they can make a nice uh, demonstration of your product, not just a piece of you know, wire stitching together. That's a separate topic, but art is important. So, X-ray comes into this nice triangle of process performance property structure triangle, or oh, this should be a pyramid instead. So, a lot of time when you deny a material, there's many factors comes into play. You want to see if your material is developed correctly or if it fits your need. Another very famous person I very res pay a lot of respect to is Richard Feynman. Um, he is a physicist. In back 1959, let me think about that. 
that's more than 63 years ago. He gave a talk. If he's ever alive, he will probably be at the age of um, almost 100, right? He talks about why there is plenty of room at the bottom. What, what did he mean by plenty of room and what did he mean by bottom? Think about 60. U.S. just won the war. Um, we're in a baby boom. We're making lots of products. Plastic happens to be a big part of it, right? And there's many advances, like nuclear weapons was developed. So there's a lot of development. But what his point is, the nanoscience was not developed. There's plenty of room. You can understand the tiny structures. Back that time, there's no SEN, there's no AFN. SEN maybe, but probably not at the resolution. There's no AFN. MMR is developed. X-ray scattering is developed. And I'll talk about why X-ray scattering was, was like a chosen one back then, because it can solve all the problems. All right. Take a read of this note. I posted a link here. I, I believe I downloaded one and put um, one in the canvas. This is a very inspiring talk. He basically predicted all the booms in the nanotechnology. So in the 90s and 2000s, you heard about all these nanotechnology boom. Nanotechnology shirts, nanotechnology shoe inserts, nanotechnology almost everywhere. But there may be some commercial gimmicks in their play. But in reality, in the scientific field, that's true. There's a lot of nanotechnology development. To highlight that, I'll highlight this slides. And uh, some of you, if you ever attended my first ever polymer calculation class back in 2016, you might have saw this slide before. So this will give you a size scale of all kind of object with the length scale on the very top from um, this is the instruments, 0.1 nanometer on the scale of an atom, all the way to the size scale of the height of Maxwell, my son. Okay. So you can see there's many things spanning at a very much different length scale. Polymers, if you look at individual polymer, you're talking about sometimes the size scale about tens of nanometer. So very much similar to a DNA molecule. Although they packed Hewley cells in a large scale, like, like this one, if you're looking at me in my hand, it's a pencil made of plastic, likely P polypropylene or polystyrene, something like that, or PVC. They are basically tons of molecular intertwined together. And if you can understand at nanoscopic scale, according to Feynman's prediction in 1959, you have an edge over your competitors to design a better material. Okay? But that was not easy. If you want to look at materials down to a few nanometers, that was very challenging. Because we are limited by our natural ability to view things down to 100 microns. If someone can see 10 microns, I think you should go to American Get Talented. If you go to, if you can see one micron object with your naked eye, you're going to be locked up by US government because they want to know <laughs> what's going on in your eye. But nanotechnology is important. It's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. Nowadays, there's journals dedicated to nanotechnology. Nanoladder, a very famous one from American Chemical Society. In, uh, Nature, a premium publish, publisher, also has a Nature Nanotechnology. Okay, and there's lots of application. I want to go in, into any of them. Um, there's also lots of interest from government level to promote this. So here is uh, five national labs got uh, approved by the Congress back in early 2000. So they constructed five national premier research center 
centered around nanotechnology, located in a different part of the US. Somewhere in Berkeley, um, I didn't put it on purpose on the first because I worked there. It happens to be that way. There's one in Mexico, Il uh, Argonne, Illinois, Oak Ridge, Tennessee. We've been there quite a few times. And there's in New York, Long Island. They all serve one purpose, advanced nanotechnology so that we can develop better material to address all kind of need. So let's take a look at where X-ray fits in. So in the early days, Hooke's microscope was developed in 1965, uh, 1665. There was a breakthrough. I think it is. It's break the, break the barrier of human being. Nobody ever could see things smaller than 100 microns until now. By this invention, you can see image in front, stem cell from leaf, which is quite impressive. Nowadays, of course, it's more modern. You can see much, much more smaller resolution, but typically limited by optical resolution on the microscope. By the diffraction limits, people usually call, because you can only see structures down to the wavelengths of your, um, your light or photons. In microscope, you are using visible light, so you don't expect to see something smaller than 200 nanometer until there's some new technology called super resolution um, microscopy, which is not the topic of this. Light microscope is great because it allows you to see much smaller things. Put in the perspective what we show in different objects, so it's very nice. It was developed much, much earlier, like four, five hundred years ago. Electron microscope is more recent development. It uses electrons, which can have much, much shorter wavelengths. This will give you the ability to see very tiny features. OK? Electron microscope allow you to see structures from tens of microns all the way down to atomic level. There's beautiful images. Um, people have shown imaging a single atoms in copper, et cetera. I won't go too much details here. So electron microscope works by accelerating electrons. Then you can look at this is a scanning micro electron microscope. You can see tiny features, virus, pluent particles, pollen particles to here, size scale about one nanometer. You can see atomic resolution. There's also people developing AFN. We have several of them in, in, in this department can look at tiny features. Um, this is actually an interesting example. Not only you can see things, you can actually also manipulate things. Using AFN to have abilities to move a single atom at the location where you want. I'm sure this is an accident the scientist happened to put them into this A letters. Probably he watched too much of that. So, what about the topic of X-ray? Where X-ray fits in this cool material development scheme? And where, where is the X-ray come from? Where is the X-ray now? And where is X-ray going? I behave like a philosophy. Where are, you? where are we come from? Where are we going, right? Important. More important than this lesson. I think if you understand that, you your life will be more happier. So think about after this class, what do you want to do? What will make you happy? So coming back topic X-ray. X, what does X mean? Why people call it X-ray at the first place? Any volunteer in the answers? No, nobody knows. X means, not X-men. OK, not that X means like powerful X-ray. X means unknown, mysterious in this particular case. It's actually the, the, the whole reason. In the early days, people had discovered there's some weird radiation could cause some of the films to decay, especially those imaging films. 
And there's this typically associated to some of the natural decay of um, isotopes. They would give off x-rays as a side product. So Ron Jing, he actually discovered this quite early, 1895, but he didn't know what is this. He has no clue and he can't see this light. He cannot show everybody what this light until he found a way. So there is some chemicals, if you radiate with x-ray, it will change its chemical composition. Very much like a camera film, but more sensitive to x-ray. So now you know, probably you guys probably see it a little bit, right? Have you seen a film camera and how does a film camera work? I see nodding, two, three. Okay, good. You're not that, that young anymore. Oh, that's a sad. I grew up playing with like film camera. I collecting film cameras all the time. So I know exactly what's going on. So you would put down layers of same films that are sensitive to the light. When light exposed to it, it's actually a photochemical reaction. You decompose your chemicals, then it will be become water soluble. So you can develop it in, in, your, in your developing solutions so you can have developing an image out of it. Same for X-ray. So later on, people find a way you can image X-ray. And that's very cool, right? Think about photography was made way before this. People can take an image of him. That's why this image existed for this particular gentleman, um, Dr. Rong Jin. But he developed a new chemistry you can see X-ray. And everybody loved it. It's like coolest technique in town. It will be probably more exciting than announcement of Tesla motor or new iPhone back then. Because everybody wants to take a picture of them. If you put your hand there, this is a picture of his wife. Hand. Let's image it. You can see the resolution is pretty poor. You can see the bone and fresh tail. Too clear, but at least you can see some parts, right? A nice wedding ring, but people do all kinds of things with it. And later on, this is a fundamental to a lot of modern technology in, in medicine. So if you go to, if you somehow hurt yourself, you're not sure your bone is fractured, you don't need to cut it open, you just take an x-ray, right? And before this, you need to cut it open. Or at least you bend and see if, if it actually cracks. <laughs> Doesn't sound fun, right? So there's more modern techniques um, developed based on this. Is, uh, CT or computation tomography. You can see what's inside your body at the much, much better resolution than when compared to in the 1950s. But this was the reason. And X-ray was very lucky. It's got the first Nobel Prize. Very first. Now let's look at this other gentleman. He's also a Nobel Physics Prize winner. It sounds very easy to win back then, but as you not, it's very hard. What his, uh, Max von Lohr's um, discovery is ability to, to image in crystals. He discovered a phenomenon called diffraction. So I'll show you what, what is credited for his Nobel Prize. So what these are, are x-ray diffraction images back in 1912. On the top, you see? Uh, kind of messy on the top left. It starts more clear for the last one where you can see those black dots like sesames throw on the floor. But there's actually meanings for these black dots. So that is in the center, that's a direct beam. All these um, pieces going around it are scattered beam, okay? He is the one showed if we throw uh, inorganic crystals, we can see diffraction happening there. Very first experiment and very first ability to show this is a capable of using X-ray. And people already know crystals pretty well. Back in 1912, people know what is crystals are. 
these are atoms packed in a regular lattice. So this was very nice because there's not a lot of way you can study crystal. Early days X-ray spectroscopy. I don't even know how to operate it. That's so cool, it looks like. But I do know if you give me a camera made in 9010, I can operate it easily. It's probably just a dark uh, pinhole camera. Modern day scattering spectroscopy is much nicer, easy to operate. We don't have this exactly model. This is a more um, in the, they call it diffractometer where you have two arms can move around to look at SATA2, SATA scan, to look at crystal structure. But uh, we have another tool I'll show you in the later picture, OK? And then comes Bragg's Law, uh, exciting development. Based on the discovery from a father and son, they both got a Warren Nobel Prize. I don't think there's many. Nobel Prize winner combination between dad and son. One exception. Nobel Prize in 1915. You could win a Nobel Prize. Like Sir um, William Henry Brock. Because when he was awarded, look at his age. 25. 25. Nobel Prize, what are you going to do for the rest of life? <laughs> You're already at your peak. So it's good to be not winning Nobel Prize at age 25, OK? <laughs> but I wouldn't mind giving me one. So for their, for their, this is a quote, for their service in analysis of crystal structure by means of x-ray. So ba based on Laura's discovery, they found a relationship, how you can use the x-ray, and based on the scattering angle to look at the lattice packing. And this unfolds to all the modern things we are doing today. So what you're going to hear about x-ray diffraction is all based on a discovery of almost 100 years ago. Now let's expand a little bit from X-ray to neutrons. So this is a uh, Clifford Shu. He works at uh, uh, Oak Ridge National Lab, and he developed in, he developed a very early X-ray instrument at there. A uh, neutron instrument, sorry. So if you ever go there, you can still see this is now be converted to a museum. Um, if you ever go there for experiment, you can go to there is a graphite reactor. So this is one of the early experimental reactors spinning off the Manhattan Project. Um, they first actually built one outside the Chicago near the Argonne Lab. They basically piled a couple of boron rods with some radioactive material. You need boron rods to absorb those, otherwise they're going to cascade and it, it give out too much heat. So later on, they built this one in Oak Ridge. So neutrons by, is by fission. So when you have heavy, heavy element, which is not stable, it's split and give out neutrons. So instead of use x-ray, which is a light, you can also use neutrons to do scattering. It behaves almost similarly, except the, the fundamental contrast is different. I'll talk a little bit later, OK? But you can see. So you might want, can I use a new form of particle deduced scattering and I might get a Nobel Prize, if possible. Uh, let's talk about females' important roles in many discoveries. So this is typical workflow in the early day even now. You throw a large crystal. It's actually very tough to grow crystals because this is a challenge, and it needs to be grow relatively large size so X-ray can hit it. And ideally, you want to grow a single crystal. So you can rotate it and look at different orientation within the crystal. You got diffraction pattern, then you can do phase reconstruction and understand what is possible orientation for the molecule. Let's take a look at this 
Probably not many of you heard about her name, Rosalind Franklin. How many of you heard about her name? Oh, great, too. Good job. How many of you heard about Watson and Crooks? Yeah? Way more, right? Because those who were awarded for Nobel Prize for discover the helical structure in DNA, and probably you were taught in the textbook at some point. But she actually made the first image of it. And there is a famous photo called Photography Number 55. So the story was she was a female scientist working at scattering technique to resolve crystalline structures. And she already made many scattering images, including many of the DNA. And this cross pattern is a unique pattern you will learn in later in this class, originated from the helical pattern. If you saw this, you will naturally think about there's some not straight fiber, not crystalline structure, et cetera, et cetera. And in a visit, I don't know, either Watson or Crick was visiting their lab and in a discussion, Watson saw this picture and they chatted about that. But sad story is, Watson took some of this surprising finding and later on further developed. Of course, it's not solely based on this image, but certainly this is a big inspiration for him to propose and later publish the work. She published a year or two later, but unfortunately the his history didn't give her enough credit. So I want everybody to know she actually took and made some of the early discovery for this DNA helical structure. Very important. Another um, very well known in the, actually this was covered in the book, uh, De Rossi um, Hodgkin. She was also no, awarded Nobel Prize. And there was a tiny typo there. In the 1964, by solving many biology structure, including cholesterols, penicillin, and vitamins. So these are big, big, huge impact in many uh, pharmaceutical or health applications. So X-ray played a critical role to resolve their structures so people can develop better material. She indeed won the Nobel Prize, so I'm very happy for her. So X-rays now, I'll give you a big picture. It looks structures anywhere between one microns all the way to Enstrom level. And uh, what we talked about, about generally they are categorized by sex wax, but there are no hard boundaries when we should call one or the other. Generally speaking, wide angle, this is what it stands for, wide angle X-ray scattering looks at smaller features. So what we have saw, if you look at diffraction of crystals, it typically is relevant to the wax. If you're looking at uh, slightly larger features, like block polymer assembly, solution assembly of particles, dispersion of fillers in metrics, uh, you typically result to small angle X-ray scattering. So, Without x-ray, we're probably not going to be this advanced now, as you can tell. Many good, great discoveries is based on x-ray. And nowadays, it's become unfold a very popular tool in material science and engineering in general. Um, it is one of the widely used to, to look at many morphology aspect of your material. Um, this is a nice figure I found. I saw it's high level of illustration what is happening, you can see. You can look at atomic structure, looking at micelles, dispersion of micelles, um, polymers, looking at virus structure, looking at protein. Protein is still a big part of um, applications nowadays, although recently there's other breakthroughs such as cryo-electron microscopy, can provide another angle to study protein structures. But as you can see, there's other applications look at all, 
almost every aspect of material development. So I'll give, quickly give you a few examples um, what they are used. And there are no way I would be able to cover everything of them, but trying to give you some ideas what they could be used. Um, printing crystallography is uh, still a big part. Many scientists are still using to solve new protein crystals to address issues with health care mostly. Let's say you have a new disease came up associated with a certain protein in your body. We don't know what the body uh, what is the protein structure look like a lot of time. We need to study it by x-ray technique. There is, um, while I was at Berkeley, there was a bin line dedicated to do this particular project, protein crystallography, and they have a very cool demonstration how much they contribute to the scientific field. So their bin line is right. It's a circle I'll show you in the later. They, they have a column, which is a weight-bearing column for the building. They printed a poster, and at that poster, they put every single structure they discover. Wrap it around the wall, you can see from the wall to ceiling. Thousands of thousands of structures discovered. Almost every single structure is going to be a size or nature paper. There is also people who have been using and develop better carbon fibers, developing better plastics. So this is an example when people in the... 70s, 80s has used this to look at in situ blowing of plastic bag. How can you blow a plastic bag, a melt to blow, so that you use less, pl less plastic but maintain the strength? There's also high performance batteries um, relevant to use x rays to solve anode cathode structures as well as those solid electrolyte structures. Gas storage, MOF cough is a big part. Metal frame, organic um, uh, uh, metal frameworks, organic frameworks they are used in hydrogen storage, etc. There's a large program dedicated to that. So, around very quickly, a couple interesting examples I saw. There's people doing x rays on your hair. So, people are trying to understand why does different hair. Some of them are curly, some of them are straight, especially Africans, Caucasians, Asians. So X-ray offers a good way to look at what's inside you here. How does each fiber is being aligned? This reminds me of some of the IU work we did last summer with one of the visitors from Forest Agriculture High School. So he's interested in teaching marine biology, and he is interested to understand how does the fission lines, different composition works with each other. So we can do fiber scattering. This is a, a little bit shameless plug. That's my work. <laughs> can help you understand morphology change while you're processing them. So what we did was we wrote through a print flexible electronics, but Processing impact morphology, so we, are develop we developed a technique to look at scattering while you are depositing your ink, so you can understand how different parameters you are changing can impact packing structure. So you can provide real-time feedback loops for your material development. Strain-induced crystallization has been shown to study rubbers, so this is an example of how Rubbers and tires were studied, so you can look at how much strain you pull to your rubbery material can induce, um, introduce crystallization, how this impacts your mechanical response of your rub. Okay? This is another example that I found interesting. People are basically studying tearing of your skin, not a human skin in this case. They develop uh, some in situ technique to look at animal skins because skin has a unique tear resistant property. They look at the microstructure within skin, what causes the reason you have very strong tear resistance. Blocopolymer, I think 
Mark mentioned, so help you to develop better membranes. And you can do some of the real-time calculation if you can combine with solvent vapor annealing. Some better ways to understand solar cell, this is one of the work from my previous mentor, Mike Tony, at the SSI, another facility at, the, at the, uh, California. They study how does solution assembly of polymer impact the device performance. So um, let's see. We're going to have two more slides. So now, you understand? Hopefully, I convinced you X-ray is useful. X-ray can do a lot of good things for you. And now it's time to talk about what we're going to um, do with x-ray, how do, where does the x-ray come from, and how does this whole x-ray scattering works? We passed the why, we're going to talk about what is x-ray a little bit. So this is actually a very good uh, paragraph um, showing what is the x-ray at the first place. So this is related to the physics of these photons. So this provides you an overview of magnetic waves. If you look at here, this is energy with respect to different wavelengths. Focusing the center is where our eye evolution evoluted over billions of years, could be very responsible to visible light. From the blue all the way to red, that's the color we can see, is basically a type of magnetic, electromagnetic wave, okay? It doesn't have any mass, but it has, uh, it has a certain velocity, which is the speed of light. So you can have different energy. High energy is UV light all the way to X-ray to gamma X-ray, which is high energy X, uh, electromagnetic wave. Here is infrared where you do all the infrared spectroscopy, infrared AF and IR. Lower energy compared to visible light, but it's also a certain light. Microwave, radio wave. Microwave oven is a great example. This is also being used to, in your cell phone technology, in radio waves, etc. Okay. So why we want to focus on this part? In a short sense, you can do scattering with all the lights. You can do scattering with radio waves as well, but it's less useful. I'll explain to you why. Here we plot frequency, so it's all correlated between frequency, energy, and the wavelengths, we call it. So there's a certain conversion you can easily do. In the energy, we typically do two things. We either call it electron volts, or um, we plot them as a nanometer. So Look at the X-ray, typically, they are tiny. They are in the order of a few instruments all the way to nanometer or tens of nanometer, okay? And this gives you an advantage. I'll explain in a layman's term. The wavelengths of your radioact radioactive wave determines what the ultimate resolution you can see, okay? So radio wave, this is one kilometer. If you want to resolve structures down to a kilometer, you can use this radiomagnetic wave. I don't need it. I, my eye can do a much better job. Microwaves, it's about to where, where our limits are. And then here is visible light. That's where why um, your light microscope can only resolve things down to 100, 200 nanometer. Anything lower than that, you will have scattering. X-rays in the order of few instruments to tens of uh, instruments, which matches your lattice of your crystal, your atomic structure. So that's an ideal source to study your material, OK? So that's why X-ray somehow is more predominant. But people can do UV light uh, scattering or light scattering. There is no limitation in that, OK? X-ray has a property of both a wave and particle. We're going to cover a little bit more. Um, 
we don't want to go too deep in that because that's going to become a quantum physics class. I'm sure I'm going to bore everybody. So this is a great example to look at another way we can plot it with the photon energy versus wavelengths. So again, wavelengths is the same as what we see there. But now we have a focus on the top left part of the spectrum, but we flipped it. So visible light, UV, soft, hard, and gamma X-ray. And here they split the X-ray into soft and hard. There's a particular reason for that. We will go through those in the later part. But uh, for now, we can just uh, generally say X-ray is a high energy, which is typically on the order of tens of kilo electron volts. Try to memorize this number. 10 kilo EV is kind of closer to most of the hard X-ray we are using. For example, the one we use in building here, are using copper alpha, that's about 8 kilo uh, electron volts. So there's, again, some application people show. And I'll mention a little bit how X-ray interact with matter, but we will discuss in more detail. The photon energy matters in two ways. The first one is its penetration power. The higher the energy, you can think about a bullet, something similar, the, fast, the deeper it can penetrate into a certain material. Okay. So in airport application, in medical CT, they want high energy because they can see through anything. And 10 keV is also pretty powerful. But if you go down to 1 kilo EV or lower, or electron, 100 electron EV, which is in the soft X-ray side, it doesn't have a lot of penetration power. For example, it cannot penetrate penetrate a 100 nanometer polymer film, um, something like that, if you're on the order of electron, elect 100 electron EV, OK? So give you some perspective. If you have a 10 kilo EV, you can penetrate a few centimeter polymer film. But with the energy go down, you can only go through a few hundreds uh, nanometer. That's a drop by almost a thousand or so. So airport security, you can pass. My luggage is how thick? Maybe 20 centimeter thick, packed of kind of different clothes. See through, no problem. OK, high energy. The sec I talked about the penetration power. The second part is the ability to interact with your material. So a certain x-ray energy can be absorbed by the material. So if everybody has done some. UV vis spectroscopy here, right? FTIR. Those are, has much lower energy. Visible light have one electron EV. If this fits into your material's ability to absorb, it will excite it, and you will have all kind of absorption and fluorescence happening. If your material can absorb high energy X-ray, you can do X-ray fluorescence and other properties as well. So it's also feasible. All right, so we're going to go into details in the next course. So I'm going to wrap up this part here. So what, what we're going to do next is I, I want everybody to read, finish the chapter one. So I listed some of the chapters associated in my slides. So go back and take a look. But this is going to be deviated slightly with the textbook. We're going to talk about our scattering based on the instrument here. I'll try to mingle these two together. When we talk about X-ray intact with matter, how scattering happens, we want to go through each single columns. Next class, I'm going to talk a little bit about X-ray source and how X-ray is generated, and a little bit about X-ray optics, how X-ray has come from, how X-ray is being controlled, then we're going to talk about X-ray environment. Here I will talk about how does X-ray interact with your material, which is polymer. There's absorption, there's scattering, there's also reflection being happened, 
we're going to go through all these. I, I might cover some of the part of x-ray scattering there. Then this, we're going to talk about x-ray detection. By the way, this is a historical moment for USN. August 24, we have first the scattering experiment here. That was been a while. I think there was sometime maybe in early 2000, they had an x-ray, but that one was broken, has never, has been sitting in the storage. So this one, four years and two days ago, we revitalized the x-ray scattering here. A big historical moment. So let's finish here. Let's wrap up a, a little bit. So we talk about why we want the x-ray in this class. Why x-ray helped a lot of material development. What x-ray generally can do, a few examples of the application. Then starting next week, we're going to talk a little bit more on x-ray interaction with matters. Not a lot of scattering theory, but when we talk about here, we're going to start to introduce x-ray scattering theory, OK? Once we finish this, we're going to go back to talk about specific uh, application example in more detail. So any question for me today in today's lecture or regarding with your textbook? No question. Great. Let's wrap up today's class. Okay.